welcome, ladies and gentlemen, um, to our public lecture this evening. It's my absolute pleasure to um, welcome Professor uh, Ivor. Ivor. Ivor Vatis, who's a uh, long standing uh, militant and organizer. Um, I want to read this out because it's a very long kind of bio here, but it gives you some idea of what he's up to. It says he's director of the Center for Post-School Education and Training, SIPSET. Is that right? The acronym. At NMMU, he has worked in all the subsectors of the post-school education and training sector. He conducts research in adults and community education, higher education, workers' education, learning in social movements and autonomous spaces. Ivor was senior researcher at the Center for Education Rights and Transformation at the University of Johannesburg and previously director of the Center for Adult Education at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He also served as deputy director of the Adult Basic Education and Training Directorate of the National Department of Education in the 1990s. He's the founder and country, di country director of the Paulo Freire Institute, South Africa. Ivor works closely with community organizations, social movements, and trade unions. So um, today, I, I don't have a title, Ivor. Um, it's just the crisis in public education. The crisis in public education. Um, I think it's important. We keep on receiving. Uh, I was talking about Richard with Richard uh, about this. We keep on being told that people are writing um, slogans on uh, around the university called Black Lives Matter. Uh, and I think it's important to understand that these lives that matter are not just simply the ones in the United States. Um, but even when it happens in Port Elizabeth, right next to us, amongst working class families, um, we should also be aware of that. So thank you very much for coming, Ivor. And I'll leave pleasure. it up to you okay. um, for about, say, 30, 40 minutes. Okay. Thanks very much. <coughs> well, sure. Richard and Michael, thanks for the invitation. Um, um, and I'm quite happy to talk to you about the crisis in public education and the reason why I wanted to refer to public education is because it is not only the schooling system that's currently in crisis. Uh, the crisis in education now extends uh, from early childhood development through um, into uh, aspects of higher education. In fact, uh, some scholars and colleagues of mine would argue that uh, higher education in this country is also uh, facing, looking down the barrel of a crisis, or it's already uh, facing uh, uh, elements of crisis, which uh, I think there is a lot of truth uh, to that. So, because there's not a lot of time, it's very difficult to talk about the crisis of public schooling, uh, there's, uh, sorry, public education, there are so many ways to come at this, uh, but I think there is general consensus uh, and at least uh, since the year 2011, that even the state uh, has acknowledged that the schooling system in South Africa is, a current, is experiencing a crisis. They've denied it for a very long time, but uh, mid-2011, uh, our Minister of Basic Education had the guts to say that there is indeed a crisis in the schooling sector. Uh, but I will point out to you that the crisis is much greater than simply schooling. But what I thought I would do is to start off uh, and throw out three big points. I think they are the three big points that I want to leave with you, or which, could, which we can talk a little bit about. And the first one is a somewhat philosophical question, and it's about what do we think... Uh, what is our vision of the kind of society we want? And what role uh, should the education system play in realizing that vision of a society? I think that's, for me, the one big point that I want to link to this crisis uh, story. The second question is, seeing that we're in a university, uh, is what is the university's role in all of this? Does the university even acknowledge that it's implicated in the crisis of education. You are teaching, we are teaching, preparing teachers here uh, in this university. So the question then, 
uh, is that I'm asking is, are you still thinking about yourself as this institute that exists, or institution that exists above and beyond the social and political system of society, and therefore do not acknowledge that you are actually part of community, and therefore you are implicated in the crisis, therefore you have to be part of the solution. That's the second point. The third point that I want to, a consideration that I want to leave you with uh, and for you to think about is that I am not convinced that the current system or current way in which institutions, governments are dealing with the education system uh, is ever going to lead to its transformation. And therefore, I would argue that the only one of the ways that need to be uh, considered is how we begin to mobilize uh, communities, organize communities, take back education and return it to uh, people and uh, confront uh, government policies that are undermining the possibility of an emancipatory education system in society. So those are my three points. And linked to that point is, of course, the idea to move academics beyond being merely curious, you know, you want to investigate, but that they actually begin uh, to involve themselves in the struggles around education. So I, let, me, <clears throat> let me leave those three points and perhaps we can have some discussion around it. So let me come to, to uh, this moment uh, of last week in Port Elizabeth. Uh, I'm sure you've followed the media reports, you've seen it on TV, and of course, as usual, uh, the first image that you see is tires burning and bullets flying around, right? Uh, that's the image of what has happened in Port Elizabeth, uh, where communities, parents in the schools decided to shut down the school. Uh, I won't go into the detail, but what then happened was is that uh, more than 23 schools in one part of Port Elizabeth were shut down, including one of the technical colleges um, in, in, that, in, one, in that community. And the reason why I'm specifically referring to the technical college is because they themselves are facing a crisis. Today and yesterday, there were student protests at a number of technical colleges across the country including Port Elizabeth, right? Um, so this problem <coughs> where the parents were basically saying, look, now we are hot for, we've had enough, and we are not going to take this anymore. We demand 143 teachers, or 145 teachers, and we want them appointed, and government response was to give them about 45, uh, 45 teachers. So. The, the, the crisis co still continues uh, because all the demands have not, met, have not been met. Now, this incident is by far not uh, an isolated incident, um, and it has a particular history that I track down to the year 2012. In 2012, this problem that has now finally begun to, to show some form of solution, parts, part, part, partly being resolved, uh, uh, was, uh, was simmering in 2011 when the same number of schools, about 20 uh, in one particular school, and I'm referring here to a uh, school uh, in one part of Port Elizabeth with about 1,200 students only had 28 teachers. The community was paying the salaries of the rest of the teachers and they were working class communities raised 70,000 rand a month to pay the salaries of the additional teachers. Right? At the same time, just further outside of Port Elizabeth in the Greenbushes area was a race uh, 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 racial, racial violence erupted at one of the schools because the school was in crisis and there was a big issue around uh, language teachers that needed to be appointed and so the language issue turned into, into a race issue 
because the colored kids are Afrikaans speaking and the black African kids are Isitosa speaking. Right? So, you, so this issue has been simmering since then and it remained unresolved until we have seen the incident that uh, played itself out last week. But let's look a little bit bigger. What, what, is, the, what, what is part of this crisis? Uh, and I'm just going to summarize and I'm selective here. Um, during 2011, when the problem was playing itself out in Port Elizabeth, we saw 175 schools being shut down in Soweto. In Soweto alone, 175 schools were shut down. And you see this black flight out of Soweto into ex model C schools. At the same time, you've seen a, a predominant kind of a white flight into, uh, into private schooling. Um, they were threatening to close down schools in the Western Cape. Uh, the throughput rate, and I'm just selecting a few stats here for you. The throughput rate, remember at the moment in South African society, kids who start at, uh, go through a 12-year period of schooling, only 24% of them make it in the, 20, in the 12 years. So our throughput rate over 12-year period is 24%. 80% okay? uh, of our grade fives have serious re reading difficulty. Right? We are spending 20% of our national budget on education. Often we hear that this is the highest uh, in, uh, on the African continent. I agree, but it doesn't mean that that's enough. Okay? Uh, we have annual student protest. Um, you can look out for it. Uh, the next round of protests are about to start around the NASFES issue. Uh, there's high uh, teacher absenteeism in our township schools. The uh, teachers have been completely demoralized, overcrowded classrooms. Uh, if you compare the teaching number of hours that teachers are teaching in a township school to a uh, normal sort of ex model C school, you're talking about three and a half hours per day versus five hours per day. And an incredibly important statistic that we need to throw into this mix is the 70% unemployment rate uh, amongst the youth in our society. Right? Because often there's reference being made to the relationship between education and the economy. Right? So this gives you an idea of the, how enormous this, this problem is. And one of the first matters that arise from, from a conversation about the crisis of education is the issue of resources. Okay? If you listen to Angie Moshecha, she's saying that she needs 3,000 more schools. 3,000. She needs 60,000 classrooms. Um, 15, close to 15,000 libraries. Uh, 14,000 computers, 16,000 multipurpose rooms, 16,000 nutrition centers, 17,000 admin blocks, and almost 20,000 laboratories. Right? So, so the first matter in all of this crisis is definitely resourcing. And I'm laying the blame for this resourcing issue squarely at the feet of a combination of the legacy of apartheid and the adoption of the state's neoliberal economic policy. Right? Uh, the, the, the transformation, I am not convinced that the transformation <coughs> of the education system is at all possible under uh, the current economic system that f through which we fund education or health, health for that matter, in our society. The others, the other, and I'm just giving you schooling. I can go to post-schooling. I can tell you that Blades of Monday is planning to, to build another 12, 12 TVET colleges. Right? He wants to increase the student numbers from something where it's around 700,000 at the moment to to something like 3 million by 2030. Uh, 
we've just opened, uh, established two new universities. The funding for these institutions are simply not easily available under the current framework, medium per term expenditure framework of, of the state. It's not going to happen. It's impossible. We're in an economic crisis right now, so we are already being threatened by more financial cuts in education next year. So that's one. A second issue that I think uh, is, is a serious matter, and it's the issue of poverty and inequality. Um, you know, we could, uh, we could talk about getting teachers uh, properly trained and skilled. We can get the curriculum fixed up. We can get all the assessment regimes in place. But if we're going to ignore uh, the issue of poverty and, and inequality, we'll never, we'll never go, go anywhere. And the facts of poverty and inequality uh, we are facing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to give you an example where education overlaps with other social policy. And it's the policy of, of health. Uh, it's, uh, it's the policies around nutrition. We've got 35% of our children in this province uh, with stunted growth. Uh, a large number of them do not have uh, access to early childhood, develop early childhood development. We don't have uh, the early child development teachers uh, to, to support these children because they are all living in an impoverished uh, environment. There's no proper uh, social policies through which they are being taken care of. So uh, poverty is an issue. Uh, resources is an issue. Early child development is probably now one of the biggest issues. We've got large numbers of children at the ages, uh, under the age of five years old, who are not, not in school. Another uh, issue that matters is the whole issue around literacy, mother tongue instruction, and uh, private, uh, public, public libraries. Right? Uh, I see Monica is sitting here, so she can probably tell us a lot about the significance of mother tongue, uh, 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 mother tongue literacy, uh, there are not teachers, uh, we are not training enough teachers for, for, to teach in, in, in mother tongue, uh, in, uh, in the mother tongue, Isitosa teachers are not reg registering at universities in the numbers, uh, university facul faculties are not often well resourced uh, to provide adequate training uh, at, uh, at, at, uh, in, in literacy education and so on. Another issue, and I'm rushing now because I think we need more time to talk. Another issue is around civil society uh, that, that matters. I think it's important to recognize the, the role that civil society organizations have played and could potentially still play in our society. What we have witnessed uh, since 1998 has been a steep decline in civil society organization involvement in education. They've either been, their lifeline was either cut due to donor funding that dried up, or they've been encouraged to convert to become pub private enterprises. So they had to become uh, business, businesses uh, that need to fund themselves through uh, the uh, funding mechanisms that the state set up through the CETAs and the National Skills, uh, Skills Fund. Uh, so what we are seeing, and this is where I have some hope, we are beginning to see uh, large numbers or large formations in communities where communities are beginning to look at society and they are beginning to organize themselves. Uh, an example is the growth in the number of community formations involved in food sovereignty. Large numbers of people in communities are now beginning to come together and they are beginning to look at how they're going to feed themselves. And they are beginning to grow vegetables. There are community groupings looking at ancillary health where they turn to a care, community, a care economy within communities 
beginning to look at themselves. So we are beginning to see uh, a number of ways in which uh, communities are beginning to organize themselves and they are beginning to operate almost uh, outside of the formal structure of the state. So there's a uh, the autonomous, there's autonom autonomous movements beginning to emerge. Of course, these groups, when you talk to them, they don't refer to themselves as such. Uh, it's us who, who can give these names. But communities are beginning to look at, I think, what happens, especially in the case of the employment uh, situation in this country. I think a large number of young people are looking at their parents too, and some of their friends with qualifications who cannot find work in the former labor market, and they are turning their backs on any prospect of finding work in the former labor market, and they are beginning uh, to act uh, in other ways to begin to, make, to, to begin to make a living. Some of these are obviously uh, not always acceptable, such as the unauthorized um, connections that we see where people are uh, connecting themselves to the grid and so there are people who earn a living out of these unauthorized uh, uh, connections and look at my language I'm not saying illegal they are unauthorized connections because people have been waiting for a very very long time for electricity so by they tired of waiting so they decided to do it for themselves and they make use of the rich skills pools that exist, uh, our electricians, uh, our mechanics in the communities to help them uh, to, to, uh, the, uh, to the grid. Um, finally, I want to just make another point, which is another crisis, and I want to connect it to the education. You know that um, at the moment we are facing uh, probably the biggest challenge uh, in our society, and it's the unemployment issue. Now, we've got about 18 million people in this country who are able-bodied, who can actually work, but they can't find employment. And there's big debates uh, in our society because parents send their kids to school, they have dreams about the, the futures of their children, what, what will they become, and so on. And uh, so they think about the for, uh, often think about employment in the way that we do under capitalism. We think uh, about employment as having a job in the formal economy. That's how we think about it. But what we are seeing is a dysfunctional labor market that is unable to absorb the labor. Okay? Uh, so there's a whole lot of discussion about the skills mismatch that there's a mismatch between, uh, between what the economy is needing and what institutions are providing. And there's a blame game beginning to happen. Institutions are being blamed by parents for not providing their children with uh, requisite knowledge to enter into particular, uh, into particular occupations and so on, which is now beginning, that argument is now beginning to fall apart. Because what we are seeing, it, it is not actually a skills crisis. It is more of a jobs crisis. Right? And that this uh, mis the discussion about the mismatch between skills and the economy uh, that we often hear, the minister himself makes that point all the time, um, is beginning to fall apart because if you look at Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, they are all struggling with the same issue. They've got an unemployment rate amongst the youth of about 52%. And the difference between what you hear uh, uh, is there's a, there's a bit more honesty, I think, from governments uh, in places like Italy acknowledging that the economy uh, in those countries have taken a serious dip and therefore it's unable to absorb labor. What we are doing in South Africa is a constant reference to this uh, mismatch uh, of skills and the need for skills. And so what we, we are seeing is that government has created what I call a warehouse with all kinds of containers 
Uh, one container has written on it a learnership, another one has written on it an uh, internship, a third one is called uh, um, uh, EPWP, a fourth one CWP. These are all containers where young people are jumping from one container into the other, but they remain trapped in this warehouse and they, which, in which they are unable uh, to get out of. And I think what some young people are beginning to do to themselves is as they inflict upon themselves this feeling of inadequacy, that they just don't have enough. They need more education, and that education uh, is going to solve the problem. And this is where I think, and I want to conclude with this point, is that this is where the problem is. Education cannot solve our economic problems. It's impossible. Uh, education is not the reason why the economy is not growing. That's not the reason. Uh, we have looked at this, we have looked at economies and we have found 19 explanations uh, about the unemployment issue uh, and the economy. And education is not on the list. Right? So we have to start think, thinking quite seriously about the purpose of education. What are we preparing citizens for? How would the, the way we prepare citizens uh, uh, connect to the vision that we have uh, of society? And what role is it that universities, community organizations play collectively to bring about that kind of society? If we don't do that, I think we will simply reproduce the crisis, and I think it is dangerous. So South, South African society is a vulnerable society, and uh, if we don't address these issues, I think we're heading for uh, an unwanting uh, state uh, in which we will have to live. <laughs>